As far as being a scientist goes, Professor Yudi Roman is the guy. He has worked for over 20 years in chemical engineering at Wisconsin, Caltech, and now MIT, and has truly been able to travel the world. And because of that, I could have directed this interview into so many different interesting areas. But ultimately, I chose to focus on this one question. What makes a scientist? I hope you guys enjoy, and if you do, make sure to subscribe. It helps a lot. Hey, what's going on everybody? Here at the Frontier Science Channel, for the first time, we are joined by Professor Yudi Roman, a full professor at MIT and a leader in the field of catalysis. Professor Roman, welcome. Thanks for having me. I am genuinely so excited to be doing this interview with you today. So let's get started. First question, what is chemical engineering? Chemical engineering is a very fun discipline. It's a combination of biology, chemistry, math, all together to solve problems related to the chemical industry. You have elements of finance, you have elements of sustainability. So it's a field that combines a lot of other areas of science into one discipline. And I know that within the field of chemical engineering, you work on catalysis. What is catalysis exactly? Well, a catalyst is a substance that, that can speed up a chemical reaction. So most of the things that we have in the world, like plastics and fuels, medicines, everything is done through chemical reactions. And we need to find ways of speeding them up so that all the processes can become more efficient. And in the middle of that, you have a catalyst, which is a substance that can allow you to speed up those chemical reactions without being consumed. And that's the area that I work on. There's this meme on the internet where people say that nobody knows what an engineer actually does in a day. So what is your guys' day to day? What do you do? Huh, I haven't seen that meme. I need to check it out. But I would say for a chemical engineer that works in academia, in a research intensive university, there's about four things where we spend most of our time. One of them is teaching and preparing for teaching classes. The other one would be running the research group that, that you have. The other one would be writing grants to sustain that research group. So we spend a lot of time doing that to get money for uh, all the projects that we run. And then also service internally to the university or to the community in outreach activities. So each day is different and uh, we yeah, shuffle between each one of those four categories that I just told you about. Nice. And what would you say is the best and worst part of a typical day? Well, for me, the best part is working with people that are very excited about science and working in the frontier of science, just like the name of your channel. And at MIT in particular, it's a lot of fun because you have access, you have contact with people that are brilliant and very interested in pushing the boundaries of science. I would say that the worst part sometimes goes into perhaps spending time in administrative duties that uh, perhaps don't allow you to work on the science part of things. And specifically speaking, what would you say is your specific role in revolutionizing the field of catalysis? Well, catalysis is a very important field of, of science. In my group in particular, we work a lot on sustainability. So finding new ways, for example, to break down plastic waste, new ways to make biofuels, um, new ways to reduce CO2 emissions and convert them into useful chemicals. So I would say that the development of new catalysts that are integrated with processes that can be scaled up so that they can be implemented quickly and replace some of the current processes that we have that pollute the world or that generate a lot of waste. So in my research group, we work on several projects associated with that, with sustainability. And I feel that we have um, yeah, made some really good strides on that aspect. And going deeper into what you said about global production, would you say there is a difference between manufacturing on an industrial scale versus in the laboratory? Absolutely. It's a very difficult task because sometimes we can find discoveries that are very important, that are very new, but deploying that technology at scale, something that will impact the world globally, is very difficult. And 
many times we do not have the resources or the infrastructure to deploy those technologies at that scale. So it's always a balance of how do you find something that is new, that is impactful, but that can also be performed in a, in a way that can reach millions and millions of people. And that's a very difficult task. Wow. It seems like you guys have a lot of massive projects. Can you talk a little bit about how you and your team of postdocs and graduate students go about working on these solutions and answers as a team? Yeah, so there's different ways in which we approach problems. You can say that one can be a bottom-up approach and the other one is a top-down approach. So for a bottom-up approach, I would say this is for, say, the more fundamental wing of, the, of my research group. We start thinking of a new concept. How do we think about catalysis in a way in which other people have not thought about it before? And we develop the fundamental framework and then we use model reactions or systems that in a way are well understood to now explain that new phenomenon that we are proposing. So that's what is called the bottom up approach because we are starting from the ground up and then we use yeah, things that are perhaps uh, have, have been understood a little bit better. And the top down approach is the opposite. So we would have a problem that we want to solve. For example, say that we want to get rid of plastic bags and we need to find a new chemical way to break down the plastic and reuse the elements that make up that plastic so that we can recycle them infinitely chemically. So we have a very specific target on what we want to achieve. And then we think backwards as to what process, what catalyst, what do we need to design to solve that particular problem. So that's usually how we begin projects. And when, after you create a hypothesis, you start with an experimental plan and you iterate over and over until you prove or disprove whatever it is that you're trying to find out. Interesting. And if you are a undergraduate student at MIT, Will you get the opportunity to work at laboratories such as yours? Yeah, MIT has a fantastic system for undergraduate students to join research groups. It's called the Europe program, uh, program the Undergraduate Research Opportunity. And pretty much you apply uh, before each of the terms begin. So in the summer, in the fall, in the spring, I usually interview the, the students, introduce them to the team. We come up with a project. And this could be anywhere from three months to six months or up to a year. These are what we call super Europe's. And in your experience as a researcher, what would you say are the key differentiators between someone who can discover and people who simply don't? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think there is a given formula for success in that particular area to discover something new or to be creative. But I feel that there are elements that are common every time one of these discoveries happen. I would say number one is that you have to internalize the work that you do. What I mean by that is that you don't have to look at it as work. This is something that you truly enjoy and something that you think about uh, even when you are not in the lab. And it's not that you are always thinking about it actively, but it's somewhere there in the back of your mind, such that when you notice something in the street or you read something in the, in the news, you can make connections that allow you to come up with a solution to a given problem that you have. I would say that's a very important element in the creative process or in the discovery process. The next one would be consistency. You know, it's uh, sometimes these open questions are very difficult to answer and it's not something that can happen in one day or one week. Many times it can take years to develop a particular answer. So sticking with it, being consistent and always showing up and uh, actively focusing on the work that you do is another very important element. And the third one, I would say you want to surround yourself with a very good team and a very good environment that allows you to be creative. What I mean by that is that if you surround yourself with people that are different from you, that can allow you to access new points of view, you'll be able to now take a look at a problem from def many different perspectives. And that's very important. And you want to do that in an environment that is conducive to be creative. That means that you don't want additional drama around you. You want to be able to 
be happy and enjoy the work that you're doing such that nothing else is on your mind other than the thing that you want to solve. Yeah, and talking a little bit more about that, how do big discoveries actually happen? Are you in the laboratory or are you doing something else like drinking coffee? It can happen different ways. Sometimes an idea just comes up in your head when you're doing random things. It can be in the shower, it can be drinking a coffee or being actively in the lab. It's something where, as I mentioned to you before, once you internalize that particular problem that you have, sometimes it just comes to you in some ways. It can be serendipitous like that, but another way in which it happens is just looking at the data that you collect. There's experiments that work and give you a lot of information, and there's a lot of experiments that fail and also give you a lot of information. So learning from those failures actually allows you to navigate the space more quickly. And that way you can discover things as well. Yes. And talking about big discoveries, you recently published a paper in Science, the most prestigious research journal about how electric fields can be used to speed up acid reactions. For those at home who don't have time to spend hours diving deep into academic literature, what specifically did you discover and why does it have such a massive impact? Yeah, it's a, it's, this is a research project that is very exciting to me, something that is very new. To give you a, a very brief summary, uh, in the field of catalysis, usually you will have two camps. You have one that is called uh, thermochemical reactions. These are reactions that you try to speed up using a catalyst and say something like temperature, heating up the system so that everything happens a little bit faster. Another area, a separate uh, area of catalysis is what is called electrocatalysis. This is where you use electricity or the electrons inside electricity to drive the, the reactions. And many times these two fields don't have a lot of connections between them. Now, what we're starting to investigate is what happens when you try to speed up a reaction with certain aspects of electrochemistry, but during a thermochemical reaction. And this is where electric fields come into play. For example, say that you have a balloon and you rub it against your head. And then this is something that charges electrostatically the surface. And that balloon usually will stick to the wall. And it's not that there's electricity there. It's just that you, create, you put some work into that balloon and now the charges are uh, separated. And that's how it sticks into, in, onto the wall. So imagine that same principle, but at the nanometer scale or the molecular scale. So we do some work on the catalyst and we now separate these charges. We put some electric fields right at the surface and that allows you to organize solvents around a particular molecule or uh, stabilize certain states of that molecule so that you can speed it up, but without actually using electricity It's just charge. So this paper, describe so it's the first example that you can do something like that with acid catalysis which is a very general class of reactions that we use for a whole bunch of, of different products that we use on a global scale yes i had the time to read this research article and it was so cool and the truth is you have hundreds of articles like this and we could talk about your research for hours but to sum it up for the viewers at home where do you see your research making an impact in 20 years? Yeah, I would say that sustainability is the biggest area where we have to work on. We have a lot of, I guess we have little time before we have a catastrophic change in our world because of climate change. And when you look at different ways in which you can do that, you can see that the transportation sector, for example, emits a lot of CO2 and the chemical sector does it as well. For example, in cement production, in plastics production, and all of these processes require new types of catalysts and new feedstock that doesn't generate CO2. And I would say that there, the development of new catalysts and new processes that do not emit CO2 while still providing the quality of life that we have right now will be major contribution in the next 20 years. And guys, this is pretty embarrassing, but while I was editing, I realized I forgot to ask one of the questions, but it's completely fine. He's going to answer the question over the phone and I will just read it out for you guys. When you're innovating and challenging existing perceptions of reality, how do you strike a balance between relying on established scientific research and questioning its validity? 
In research, it is very important to always check the fundamentals, but at the same time, not be blinded by preconceived answers. So it is very important to strike precisely the balance that you talk about. That means that you have to know very well the foundation of science. So for example, in my field, this would be the realm of thermodynamics, for example, and this is which reactions are possible at a given set of conditions. Knowing that, now you have to get creative and start making connections with other fields other areas such that you can now find solutions perhaps outside of the box such that you are not biased by information out there that uh, or not as much information but interpretation of data so for example when you read a paper from another group it is very important that you understand the data as is just the raw data the the facts of how the experiments were performed and also the methodology of how that data was collected now there's always a discussion section in a paper and that is something that you have to read but always take with a grain of salt because there could be multiple interpretations of that data set so while you can take into consideration how the authors interpreted the data it is very important that you yourself make your own conclusions based on your foundation and that is how you try to strike that balance and professor doman these are all the questions i have for you today so thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with me today Thanks for having me. And of course, um, for the viewers at home, if you enjoy this type of content, please subscribe.